All right, testing one, two, three. It looks like it's time to begin our Bible study tonight. It's going to be back in the house of the Lord on this Saturday evening. Reverend Berger, sir, would you please stand and pray over the Bible study and ask the Lord's blessings tonight. All right, welcome, and uh, a lot going on right now, and uh, so the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Tonight we're going to start Matthew, I mean not Matthew, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah chapter 25, and like Mary's song of praise found in Luke chapter 46, or Luke chapter 1 verses 46 through 56, Isaiah in these first five verses of this chapter is a song of praise for what God has done. The remnant were pitifully small. All that was left of after, I guess you could say after the, the judgment of God and after uh, the, uh, the prophecies that were fulfilled, the remnant were small, were small. And uh, though the number be great, of those that are in heaven, uh, that number that no man can number, compared to those that did not make it, that number is small. Few are they that find it. That's why we are to strive to enter in at the straight gate. For broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction, and many go in thereat. Like the gleanings, left in the corner of a field, or a few olives missed at the top of a tree. These are descriptions of all the remnant of Israel that was left. A nation once mighty and great. Think of the time of David's reign and Solomon's reign, the wealthiest nation on the face of the earth at that time, and perhaps uh, all the way up to modern day time, America probably being... Uh, the greatest uh, nation uh, as far as wealth is concerned, perhaps. And I guess if you were to go back in time and compare the two, what we're trying to say is that Israel at one time was a mighty, great, prosperous nation, blessed by God. But they lost that blessing as they turned away from him. And now just a few left. Of all that great nation is all that remains. So small that Amos compared the remnant to a single coal left glowing after a campfire or to the legs and ears left from a lion's kill. Amos chapter 3 verse 12, thus saith the Lord, as the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a couch. And in Amos chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. You know, that's a message uh, that is very uh, 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 worthy today. Prepare to meet thy God. There's a lot of people who don't think that they're going to stand before him one day. They live their life um, in a way that is very uh, spiritually, very, very detrimental to their soul. They live it with an attitude of, uh, I don't care, I don't care. But God has to say, now... But there's going to come a time when that is going to change, and it's going to change drastically. They're going to be pleading for God's mercy. But God's mercy, the time of God's mercy is right now. 
The time of God's mercy is while uh, the day is still daytime, and the day is still day because the church is here. The gospel is still being preached, but there's coming a time when the night is going to come, and the judgment of God is going to follow that time. Let's go on. But after the storm comes a bright rainbow. After all that God does for basically trying to get the attention of people, uh, sometimes it, and it's, it's, it's dramatic, the storm comes, but then there's a time of calm, a bright rainbow of promise. God will not only deliver his people, he will take away their hearts of stone and give them new ones. Ezekiel chapter 36. Now remember, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, these were all prophets that basically prophesied the same thing, just different time periods, uh, warning the nation, warning the people, warning the rulers not to do what they were doing. Would they listen? No. Some did, just as it is today. Not all listened to the gospel. Not all obey. Not all willing to humble themselves and obey. And so it was in Isaiah's day. Ezekiel chapter 36, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. Not only will he take away their hearts of stone and give them new ones, he will also establish a new covenant with them. Really, what God is going to do for them and is give them a new beginning, a new beginning. That's what God still does today, right? He offers all, whosoever will, a new beginning. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things <clears throat> become new. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 30, 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall after but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and write in their hearts, and will be their God. And they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Not only will God take away their heart of stone and give them new ones and establish a new covenant with them, he will also spread a feast of all kinds of people. Now, this is kind of an introduction going into this new chapter, all right? The Bible says, and in this mountain, Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 8, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make un unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, a fat of fat things full of marrow and of wines on the lees, well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering calf over all his people and the veil that is spread over the, all the nations. He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Little wonder, after the darkness of chapter 24, this chapter opens with a song of the redeemed. Tonight, we're going to take a closer look at this song. There are three features of this song that are particularly important to us tonight. And so let's look at 
this song as it is sung in its first six verses of this chapter. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city and heap, of a defense city, a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible one is as a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in dry places, even the heat with the shadows of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. The first feature that stands out in this song is the fact that God is faithful to a plan made long ago. He said what? O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. What God really teaches us to do is to be faithful. Faithfulness is one of his attributes. God is faithful. Not only uh, is God's counsel to us to be faithful like he is, but God wants us to be truth bearers also as he is. God is truth. Let every man be a lie and God be true, right? Let God be true and every man a lie. Faithfulness is a particularly Old Testament word signifying loyalty and commitment to the covenant or to the covenant God has made with us through his son. God made this commitment when? Way back in the garden. God told Adam. He told Eve. He said, you're going to have a child. Or one from, you know, uh, one of his own, one of Adam's own, would bruise the heel or the head of Satan. And Satan would bruise his heel. This uh, is a reference uh, from the very beginning of God's promise to send a redeemer, a savior. He was speaking about Jesus right there. God is faithful. The reason why God, God's judgments came upon the nations back then, and especially upon the nation of Israel, was because Israel was supposed to be the nation from which Jesus would come. But they decided to, instead of walking uprightly before God, instead of keeping themselves pure from sin, they decided to become an exceedingly sinful nation. And so to preserve, uh, to preserve the seed of Adam, and really to preserve uh, the, the, the ability for the Lord to come, God sent judgment to stop uh, the, the downward progression of that nation, of that nation. Again, God is faithful to his promise. He is faithful to the commitments that he's made. The things that he said he would do, he will do them. It may take time. It may take time. But God is always right on time. When the answer comes, it is always right on on time, fullness. Again, 30 times, over 30 times, the Psalms rejoice in God's faithfulness. God keeps his word. That's something that we can count on. That's something that we can base our life on. It's something that we can stand on. It's not the promises of God are not sifting, shifting sand. 
they are, yea, and in him, amen. Now, we may want uh, some of the promises that, that God has made to, to come to pass right now, but not all of God's promises are fulfilled right now, like the promise of one day seeing him face to face. Now, you know, that would be all right if my time came tonight. But I'm not going to go out and cast myself off of a bridge. Or I'm not going to go out and stick a gun to my head and pull the trigger to hasten that time. We'll let God decide when that time is. That's what God wants us to do. Remember, the devil tried to get Jesus to cast himself off. Uh, and, and really because he, he, he said, well... The angels have been given charge over thee. So he said, if you were to fall, they would help you. If you were to cast yourself off, the devil said to Jesus, uh, the devils would see to it that you would not hurt yourself, basically. But I don't know if that would have happened or not. Because Jesus would have been in, in complete violation of the word of God. How do we know? Because Jesus rebuked the devil by saying, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So the devil was getting or trying to get Jesus to tempt the Lord his God. And so in that failure, there could have been a problem. So Jesus did the right thing by doing what? Standing on the word of God. Standing and using the word of God. It was his defense and it absolutely worked. God's word, when we use it right, will work all the time in our life. Uh, for uh, the Bible study tonight, who are the helpless? A lot of people think that the helpless are only those who, uh, and the poor are only those who absolutely have no money who absolutely have nothing, but uh, that, that may not be a complete description because there's a lot of people who have a lot of money, but they're poor in their spirit. They're poor in their soul. In other words, they, they don't think too highly about the broken and contrite heart. The Bible says, Concerning proud or pride, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Just because a man has money doesn't mean, doesn't mean that he cannot be humble. Just because a man has money or a woman has money doesn't mean that they cannot be poor in spirit. In other words, they understand that their money really isn't anything. And a man or a woman like that, oftentimes, they use their money for what? They use their money to help others. They see their need. They understand, man, God has blessed me so that I can be a blessing to others. And so what I'm trying to say is that the poor are not just those who are poor financially. There are a lot of people who understand that though they are rich, they are poor spiritually. And they see their need of God, and they get to God, and God blesses them as they are even now. God doesn't take away their riches from them. He only takes away their sin. He only takes away their sorrow. He only takes away their shame. God cares about every aspect of our life. I, I, I oftentimes think about the rich ruler that came to Jesus wanting to know what good thing he had to do to uh, uh, inherit eternal life. And Jesus said, well, if thou will be perfect and, and happy. He said, go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. The Bible says, at that saying, he went away sorrowful. Now, what, if, what would have happened to that man if, or, or uh, if that man would have said, hey, all right, Lord, let me, he whooped out his, his cell phone and he got a hold of his account and said, 
sell off all my assets. Sell them all off. Find the best charity that you can find and give everything to it. In my mind, in my mind, now this is just my opinion, Jesus could have done two things. He could have let the man do what he was going to do, right? He could have let the man go through with it, and, and, and then uh, the man would have followed Jesus, right? But he would have been given it all back in time anyways. Because the very things that we give up for God, God gives them right back to us. Or he could have told the man, hey, don't worry about it. Don't just, just, just call your, 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 your accountant and say, uh, and say uh, don't, don't just hold off on that. Let me, let me get back with you on that. You see, all God is looking for is a willing heart. All God is looking for is someone who will say, with what they have in life, I'm here to serve you. What I have belongs to you because uh, I want to belong to you. I want every aspect of my life to belong to you. And every aspect of our life that belongs to him, God can bless it. Amen. God helps the helpless. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is in a storm, is as a storm against the wall. The poor and the needy are promised help from a merciful and gracious God. This is how Isaiah saw himself crying in response to God's majesty, woe is me. Again, the poor and needy are not just those who have no money. There are those who understand that uh, they need God. We need God. There's a lot of there's a lot of wealthy people who who understand that, and there's a lot of uh, 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 poor people who who don't understand. And they don't even care. And so God is not. He doesn't judge a man based on what he has or doesn't have. God, God really bases, he judges us, or, or however we want to use the term, based on what? Our uh, realization or our um, uh, willingness to say, you know what? I need God. If my life is going to work, if I'm, you know, if I'm not going to bust hell, if, if, if I'm going to get my life, I need to get to God. And it's that person right there that God begins to work even over time in their life to bring them to the place that God wants them to be. Let's go on. In the searing heat of a Middle Eastern summer, the shelter provided by a shadow can be a lifesaver. But shadows of this kind are temporary and shifting. I remember uh, one time in the Army we were sent down to Fort Irwin. Fort Irwin, California is out in the middle of the desert. What desert is that down there? That's the Mojave. The Mojave Desert. That day it hit 120-something degrees. And I, w I happened to be injured in, in, in the training. They said I was an injury. And they put, so they put me in this field, uh, field hospital, which was a bunch of shelter house uh, Tied up and, and that made a, a place of shade. The problem with that shade was that about every 15 minutes you were out in the sun. As that sun moved, so did the shadow. You were under the shadow at one time, but then you're out in the sun. And you knew it if you were asleep. You knew it not long after that because you began to get hot. In the searing heat of a Middle Eastern summer... The shelter provided by a shadow can be a lifesaver, but shadows of this kind are temporary and shifting. As Jonah found crouching under the gourd vine, such protection is short-lived. There is, however, a source of relief from the heat that is permanent. It is found in verses 4 and 5 of this chapter. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, 
a strength to the needy in its distress, a refuge from storms, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. In other words, God's help is permanent. God's deliverance is permanent. This is also the theme of Psalm chapter 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. And thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence, man, nor for the COVID, the pestilence. People have been made to be afraid. What are we afraid of? Here he said what? We don't have to be afraid of these things, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, <laughs> nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Another feature, and we're going to close right here. That stands out in the song of Isaiah chapter 25 is the idea that God is immutable. The word immutable means unchanging, not even capable of changing. God is not capable of changing. Why should he be? God, there's no reason for God. What can God do better than he's already done? He can't do any better. I mean, that didn't sound very good about God. God can't do any better. But see, God's not like us. God doesn't need to improve. We're the ones that stand in need of improvement. We're the ones that have fallen short. God is helping us to what? To stop uh, ourselves from uh, continuing to fall short. He has given us a mark. Press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The implication of verse 4 is that just as God has proved a help in the past, he will continue to do so now and in the future. The enemy says, where is your God? Where is our God? America, where is your God? The answer to that question is where? Is what? <laughs> right where we left him. You say, well, I haven't left him. Then he's with you, right? And so that's where God wants to be, is with us. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But you see, we can walk away from him. We can leave him at home. The Bible says, because the love of many waxeth, uh, oh no, because iniquity doth abound, the love of many waxeth cold. Iniquity in the heart, abounding. It causes the love of many for God to wax cold. Why? Because they're no longer walking after the spirit, but now they're walking after the flesh. All right? He will continue to do so now and in the future. His faithfulness implies dependability. You can depend on him. God's shadow never shifts because God does not change. James chapter 1. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. 
God is not evolving or in flux. The Bible is resolute as to the immutability of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here in Isaiah, Isaiah implies that God's character does not change. The immutability of God is something Isaiah is fond of emphasizing again and again. God's life does not change. Listen. He said, I am the first and the last. God's truth does not change. All men are like grass. The grass withers, but the word of God stands forever. It abides forever. God's purposes do not change. He has a plan made in eternity. And that plan includes whosoever will. And it will not change. God's not going to change it for you. He's not going to change it for me. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to go God's way. If you want to be part of his glorious kingdom in eternity, you've got to do it his way. Now, you think you can change God. You say, well, who are you talking to? I'm talking to that spirit that's out there in the world, that spirit that says God, God accepts immorality now. God doesn't the, the, <laughs> The, the ungodly shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That hasn't changed. We're going to have to tear that out of the Bible now, I guess, because, um, but you see, God hasn't changed his word. Man may change his word. Man may change the word of God. But God didn't give man that authority. And so, if God didn't give man the authority to change the word of God, then the word of God hasn't changed. It says the same thing today as it did when it was first penned. It means the same thing today as it did when it was first penned. And uh, thank God for that because now we, we have a real solution. We have a real answer to the problem. The problem or the answer to the problem is salvation. Thank God that God's plan is the plan of redemption, the plan of deliverance, and it is eternal in nature. God didn't save us just to let us die and rot in some grave somewhere. He saved us to bring us home to where he is, where we will be forevermore with him. Yes, our body may go to the grave if we don't go, if we're not part of that number of those that are alive and remain after the dead in Christ first rise. Our body will go to the grave, but God's not going to leave it there. He's going to call it up out of the grave. And uh, you talk about, you talk about uh, going to the hairdresser. You talk about, <laughs> you're talking about getting a complete makeover somewhere between uh, lying there in that casket. And by the time, uh, by the time uh, that, 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 that those, those ashes or those dust, bone fragments or whatever's in that, in that casket comes out, it's going to be made whole. It's going to be made whole. There's going to be a repatriating of body, soul, and spirit. I don't know how God is going to, I guess he's going to do it the same way he formed man out of the dust of the ground, right? He did it once, he could do it again. And so, uh, man, that's exciting. That's exciting. Tonight, thank God for this reprieve, and, and, and it is a reprieve. It is a reprieve. Because there's still a lot more in this uh, this Old Testament uh, prophets prophecy. There's still a lot more, and uh, there's still a lot a lot of bad things that are to come. And the reason why is because of the steadfast refusal of God's people to change. They want God to do all the changing, but you see, God can't change, and God is not going to change. Why, again, why, why should he? Why would he? Man, you know, he's kept things in pretty good order from, from the very beginning. So what, he doesn't need to change the way he does anything because it works. And so what it means is that we are the ones, we are the ones who need to let God change us. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for the promise of your, your word I thank you for the promise of 
your salvation, your deliverance, the promise of your help. For you are definitely a very present help in a time of need. God, have your way tonight in the hearts and lives of each and every one here and those of the, those that are following along on uh, Facebook Live. Have your way tonight. Strengthen us as an individual. Strengthen us as a body of believers. Accomplish your will in our church. Help us to uh, do everything that you would have us to do the way you would have us to do it. And God, let us see the blessings of the Lord for doing so upon all that we we make ourselves and all that we do for you. In Jesus' wonderful and glorious name, we pray these things for your glory. Amen and amen. Are there any questions tonight? No questions? Okay. All right. Um, we've been working over in the children's church. Reverend Wick is over there right now uh, trying to push that thing through and uh, uh, especially some of those bathrooms. We tore the bathrooms apart. And so 